Hello and welcome to Tidy X episode 16. All right, my name is Ellis Hughes. I'm a statistical programmer at Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward, and I do data analysis and sport. And you can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can find both of us with questions or comments at tidy.explained at gmail.com. Yeah, and I uh, just wanted to give a quick shout out to all our subscribers. Uh, we really appreciate it and all the comments that you guys have left on our videos. I know it gives us a lot of joy to be looking and seeing how valuable people have been finding this, um, this screencast, and we hope to continue to give you guys great content. All right, so this week's uh, Tidy X, we're going through a Tidy Tuesday data set again. Um, the data set this week uh, that Thomas Mock put up is on caribou location tracking. So this is, you know, our neighbors to the north in British Columbia, uh, since Patrick and I are both in Seattle. Um, this data set was it was pretty large, actually. Um, this is this is kind of uncommon for Tidy Tuesday, but they've got 250,000 location tags of uh, what 260 caribou. Um, so it's you know it's fairly large uh, data set here. Um, it's you know this is this is uh, we're over here and this is kind of the roughly the area that we were looking at. Uh, for for this week's data set, um, so yeah, it was it was pretty fun. Uh, it's pretty large, and there were some great visualizations as always. Lots of maps because uh, we had a lot of uh, visualization of like location information about these caribou, which is you know the whole point. Um, so the one that we chose to go through this week is from Ji Hong Zhang, uh, where he created this visualization here. Uh, Patrick, do you want to talk about this for a sec? Yeah. So he's basically uh, created this. He it's a cool map concept, so we're going to go over how to load a map into um, into uh, into R and, and plot over top of it. So he took this map of the uh, British Columbia caribou, and each point is representing a location. You can see longitude and latitude as the uh, um, x and y axes. Uh, each lo each point is representing a location of one of the two hundred. I think it's two hundred and eighty six individual caribou. And basically, where they were charted over time, as the uh, the wildlife workers tagged these caribou and, and watched their movements over time to try and understand their uh, behavior. So it's a cool, um, uh, you know, spatial kind of data set for anybody who works in sport. That's sort of all the rage right now is um, spatial tracking and, and things like that. And um, it was a fun one for me because my PhD was actually in. Um, uh, wearable technology, particularly GPS and accelerometers mm. in, um, in American football players. So, uh, kind that. of a fun, yeah, fun topic. Yeah. So, uh, Ji Hong posted his, uh, his code up here, uh, as a screenshot. So we, we took this and we rewrote it into a markdown that we have in our, our studio session over here. Um, so yeah, thank you, Ji Hong for, for letting us go through this. All right. So the first thing he did when you look at this code, so we've broken it out a little bit, um, but you in his code, you could see comments where he was breaking out each section. So we tried to follow that. Um, so first thing he does is loads in Tidyverse, which is you know your expected library for data manipulation that everyone, everyone uses these days. Uh, but next he has this library, ggmap. So ggmap is the library that's gonna be providing a lot of the background for us for this, uh, this plotting. So this connects to Google, I believe, um, on, and then pulls down some mapping information for us. So let's load that in. Um, as always, make sure to set your packages when you use them if you produce an analysis or something, because this is the only way that a lot of these authors get their citations out of. So always be sure to do that. All right, so next uh, he loads in his data. So he's got individuals and locations. Um, he, this case, he used the the slugs that Thomas puts up. Uh, Tidy Tuesday R actually just got accepted to Cran this week, so wow. going forward, yeah, Look thank you. Yeah, so going forward, everyone can uh, can just use uh, TT load out of the Tidy Tuesday R package to get all their their data out of there, and I believe that's going to become the preferred way to be using um, to be pulling data in rather than using these long slugs. So I'm really excited for that. All right. So then he does an STR, so structure on individuals, just to kind of get a quick look at what's going on here. So this is similar to a like glimpse outside of uh, this in Tidyverse out of the plier. 
And so you get a look at all the column names that exist here. So you've got animal ID, sex of the animal, uh, the life stage. Um, it's got some attributes that are that were assigned by uh, Radar. That, that that's not super important. Um, cool. So he's got some information here about these animals, and individuals. There's 286 rows in this data set. So then what he does, uh, which we thought was give us a second to think about this, was he then takes individuals and does a left join with locations. And so locations um, is actually a pretty large data set. Let's do a glimpse on that. So it's 249,000 rows. That's, <laughs> that's pretty large. That's a, that's a lot there. Um, and he does a left join with locations by animal ID. And so now what he's trying to do is he's trying to combine the two, two data frames there. So he gets all this information about the animals combined with their uh, locations. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is not an uncommon step here. So DT, but all right. So it's, it's got all this information here, but if you do a quick look, it grew. It's larger now. It's 296,000 rows now before it was um, 249. 249. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what this indicates is there wasn't uh, a one-to-one -one relationship between animal ID inside locations and in individuals. So this, this, this sort of thing happens all the time. I wouldn't worry about this too much, uh, but let's just step forward and, and see what happens. So, okay, first then he uh, sets the theme using theme set. So this is, will set all plots in your R session at this point to be using theme BW. Um, and then here, I thought this was pretty, pretty clever here is he sets the bounding box for the, the plot. So he uses, um, since we're doing a plot here, he, and he's going to be wanting to pull this information out of Google, he's going to need to tell Google what what how how large of a map am I going to need to be pulling down? And so he uses this uh, this this way here. So he does left. So this is the leftmost. Uh, how far to the left he wants to be looking? It'll be the min of DT longitude. So how far to the left he wants to look will be the the smallest longitude value, and then subtract one after that. So it moves one longitude degree over. No, I forget the actual units of measurements for long, longitude and latitude and the same sort of thing with the right he moves looks as far how far right are my maximum r or uh, maximum data sets or data points and then look one more unit over same concept for looking up and down and so then he uses this get map function which is in gg map um, where he pulls down this information so he's telling it all right here's the the area that i want to be pulling from i want to be pulling from google and the map type I want is terrain. So, so Patrick, we talked a little bit about this as we were going through this. Yeah, this uh, is, um, yeah, there's tons of options too. The get map function, the get map package is a really handy one. Um, I've, I've done, if you're, if you work in sport and you do anything with like spatial data, particularly if you're working with endurance athletes, I've done a lot with cyclists and runners and kind of building their own dashboards. And we'll frequently use these maps um, to plot their data and maybe plot something like velocity or um, altitude gain across their rides or their runs. Usually we'd use something like the roadmap there. Um, uh, but you, you, you know, you can use lots of different choices you might use terrain if they were doing, if it was like an off off road type of ride, like a mountain bike ride or uh, some sort of um, cross country run. Uh, but this is a super handy thing to use. And that the, what he did there with the where setting the, uh, specifying the longitude and latitude of the maps is super helpful. Uh, typically, like the way I've done this with different athletes data is to uh, set the where um, basically within a uh, within a shiny app. So whatever day they select for the training day, the where will automatically change the longitude and latitude. So they could essentially have a training session in California today and a training session in New York City tomorrow, and it would automatically just start changing and conforming the map to wherever they were in the in the country. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. cool. All right. 
So, so he scraped all this information. He used map type terrain, which is, uh, you know, showing the terrain of the area that he pulled down, and he assigned it to my map. So, next, what he's going to do is using GG Map, um, he's going to be drawing, creating, you know, his his uh, GG plot object. But now it's got this map on the background, right? So that's that's what this is doing here. And then the, the concept after that is exactly what you'd expect with any sort of ggplot extension where you're able to just layer on the next geome. So he's got this geome of the map on the, on the lowest level and now he's gonna add the points, right? So he's uh, the data that he's passing is the DT, which is the, the data set where you combine the individuals lo with locations. He's setting the uh, X axis so the point, uh, the X location of the point is based on longitude the y-axis is based on latitude, and he's coloring them based off the season because we have that seasonality information in the location data set. And then he sets alpha to be 0.3 because there's so many data sets or data points there, they're going to be overlapping. And so if you want to see like density, so how many are in the same spot, you want to set your alpha to be relatively low. So that way you can kind of see a dense, it's like a combination between a point and a density. Um, so that's kind of a fun way to do it. So let's quickly run that. There, there are a lot of points in this um, data set, like, like we've talked about. There's you know, nearly 300,000 points. And no matter what visualization tool you're using, that's a lot, a lot of information to be figuring out. Because if a GM point to it needs to figure out, oh, uh, why did it do that? Let's, let's run that again, give that an opportunity to figure itself out again, because it, it did work earlier. We know that. Uh, <laughs> as evidence of him making that plot before. Uh, but yeah, like we said, there's just it's just a lot of information to be plotting. So no matter no matter what like plotting tool you're gonna be using, if you get information at this density. Yeah, so it so it ran my computer's still figuring out how to actually visualize it. Like I said a lot of information here um, that's going on. Um but yeah, so that's just the thing you want to consider is you you can there's a few ways you could try to resolve this um, if you're really wanting to just look at trends what you could do is you could do like a heat map sort of situation or a there we go uh, but yeah like a heat map sort of situation or uh, something like that where if you don't necessarily care about the individual points you just want to look at a trend a point might not be the best tool but it still as you can see here, is a pretty pretty great graphic. All right, why did I stretch that? Now the computer's gonna gonna struggle for a little bit again. Chug, yeah. <laughs> Chug a lug lug. But yeah, so you can see like there's trends like uh, in the summer here they tend to go a little bit higher. It looks like in the um, into the mountains there, and then in the winter they go a little bit lower. At least that's that's what it looks like to me. Mm -hmm. uh, which you know makes sense. You know, in the summer it's going to be more lush further or uh, further up um, and you know not as much snow and whatnot mm -hmm. and then in the in the winter you're gonna go on to go lower because you know you want to go where the food is and they're caribou and so the plants are gonna die during the winter yeah let's let's uh let's not wait for that to figure itself out uh, but one thing that we like we did note is that DT has some some records that are being overlapped because they they um, you can see DT, we got 296. So we got 50,000 new records that didn't exist before. So we so we, we jumped into this a little bit. And there are records that are individuals. I think my computer's just struggling. Yeah, it's struggling. But point is, there there are a few animals that were listed a couple times in the individuals, um, in the individ individuals data set there. Uh, so one way, if you want to keep this information, is you could call uh, distinct, which is a, a function inside of uh, tidyverse. Yeah, I think it's out of the plier, where it'll then remove rows that have duplicate information of other rows. So it'd just be a very simple distinct. Yeah, just just make sure if you call distinct, I think you you want to do dot keep all equals true if you want all of the columns, I believe, because uh, I think it'll 
it'll get rid of all the columns, just keeping the distinct column that you specify. Yeah, if you specify, like if you do animal yeah. ID, then you'd want to yeah. do keep all. Yeah. Keep dot all equals true. I think it's dot keep all. Something along those lines. Yeah. Point is you want to do something like that if you want to keep everything. You can also just do distinct and then it'll look at all the columns to figure out which records are unique. So yeah, so oh, that's really? just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So that's just another way to look at it. Um, I'm not going to wait for this to finish up because it's not super important. Uh, I just wanted to bring that up. All right, so let's end that. I'm just going to... Hit the kill switch. Hit the kill switch if I can. Yeah. No, I'm just going to close that. Don't save. All right, let's just bring up my R session again. All right. All right, so now we're going to jump over. So thank you so much, Ji Hong, for letting us go through your code and explain how it works. Uh, maps are a thing that I don't get to use very often, and I always seem to struggle with it whenever I'm doing it on my own stuff. Uh, but this was a super simple example of how to get going with it and how to just, you know, start out with creating your, your maps. So yeah. thank you so much for that. Awesome job. Yeah. All right. So so now we're going to jump in to uh, some other some other stuff. Uh, but, you know, similar using using the spatial analysis and visualization techniques that uh, are applicable to that. Uh, yep. so, so Patrick wrote this up. So Patrick, why don't you take us through this? Yeah. So I figured uh, since uh, spatial analysis is pretty popular in sport, we kind of could have done uh, either something with runner's data and, and tracking over maps, or we could have done something like this, like making NBA shot charts, which are the classic uh, ones that were popularized by Kirk Goldsberry and, and Grantland. Um, so we show you how to do that. There's a whole bunch of web scraping in here. Um, similar to uh, Ji Hong's uh, uh, example, we're going to plot this over a, uh, an image of a court. Um, so uh, that in, the, in that case, the court is our map. Mm -hmm. So we start out, as we always do, with a little bit of um, housekeeping, loading in the packages that we want. Uh, Ellis did a nice job of kind of just um, commenting out exactly why we loaded some of these packages since this is probably the most we've ever loaded in one of our screencasts. <laughs> uh, and we have some stuff for data manipulation. Obviously, Tidyverse all the time is our preferred choice for that. Uh, Glue, you'll see why that comes in handy for uh, some of the web scraping later. Our vest is obviously a, a easy to use package for web scraping. Um, the image plotting uh, we'll use and we'll talk about here in a second. These are um, packages that are necessary for bringing in the JPEG that we used as our, our quote-unquote map to underpin the, um, the points within the shot charts. Uh, and then a little utility library here, which um, we'll use later on if, if we can get to it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just for setting up the um, yeah. paths for, for your project. Um, so it's just a helpful tool to have. Yeah, and our theme set, uh, we have it light because I, I don't know why I always set it to that, but I guess we could probably set it to minimal, which would probably make more sense, um, and, and you'll see why here in, uh, in a second. Um, so the first thing then that I wanted to do was um, uh, pull in a, a JPEG of a, a half court. There's two options we really had. One was uh, you could draw the court yourself in ggplot using lines, um, but you know, you'd have to use a lot of geometry and uh, um, sine and, and cosine and stuff like that to make the half court um, and to make the like half circle angles and things like that. Uh, it's much harder than a football field where everything's straight lines. So I decided to take the um, easy route and just go <laughs> ahead and uh, find a JPEG off of Google. So um, whoever runs the website, the data game, uh, dot file uh, dot wordpress.com thank you very much um, so the first thing I did was I pull in the URL uh, which is in the first step there and then the next step that I did was I take that URL I turn it into uh, using uh, get URL function which uses uh, which turns it into content that R can use and then I turn it into a JPEG and then I call this raster grob function which is basically a way of R uh, of helping R read the JPEG and turn it into something that it can use um, 
uh, later on for, for graphing purposes. Yeah, it turns it into a, a grob, which is a graphic graphical object, I believe, is what it's called. Yeah. yeah. So let's, uh, all right, so we've run that. Run all that. We got that there. Cool. Boom, raster grab. All right. All right. Um, you could, uh, this this part you wrote was scraping player IDs. Yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah, so uh, so we're going to be pulling some some information off of basketballreference.com. Uh, so what we did is we wanted to get a, a list of all the players that played in 2019. Uh, and get their quote player code. So the way that Basketball Reference and a lot of the, the reference.com sites go is they create a, a reference ID for a player. And it's not always incredibly obvious what that ID is gonna be. Um, so rather than us trying to guess and, and figure it out, what we thought we'd do is we would get the, the codes directly from the website there. So let's quickly go over to basketballreference.com. Right here. All right. So what we do is we have this table here that we want to be pulling out the players' uh, information from. Um, so we know that this is a, a table there, uh, and if you look at this table, you can see that these all these players have have links to them. So this, if I were to click on that, this would take me to uh, his actual site, which would have the code on it. So what we do when we're scraping it is we do this inspect. At least this is how I like to do it to try to figure out what's going on here. So we know we want to be pulling a table because this is this is what contains it's the did or the um, in the DOM. So HTML scraping is kind of weird. You have to know a little bit about the DOM and and stuff. But basically, what it comes down to is we know we want to be pulling the table element out of this. Uh, that and then even more going further down, we want to be pulling the if you look at when I look at this, we want to be pulling the A tags out of this. So the table tag first is what we're going to want to go to. So we're only going to uh, pull and then the A tags that are within the table to again then get this href and the player name. So let's just jump back over to this. So as you can see here, this is that's exactly what I did. So I loaded the HTML. I went and I grabbed the T body, which is the table body uh, element, and then I took all the nodes that were A. So all the elements that were A, which is an HTML means it's a it's a link. It'll make any text into a link. Um, but if you do a quick look back at this table, there's also they're not just player, but there's also team. So there's some cleanup I'm going to have to do around that. So what I do is I first I I don't try to clean it up at first. What I do is I grab all the links, I go for each link, give me the href, which is the, the player code, and then get the text, which is the player's name. And I create a data frame of that. So now I have a data frame of each individual player and their rank, but I also have a bunch of information about the teams and their links as well. So then what I do is I do this filtering step here to keep only the players. So I know that the, the players links all start with the uh, string players. So that's what I do. I do a grapple, which is a, a utility for searching through strings using regular expressions um, to then clean up the link. And then I do a distinct because there's a few times players played for multiple teams, so they get listed multiple times, and I don't really care to have that listed multiple times. So let's do a quick run of that. See so here we get a data frame that contains this pl the player's information and their name there. Uh, but as you can see, there's some extra information around here. Like we, we don't need players anymore and we don't need this.html um, anymore. So what we do is we do this mutate here. So from the tools package, which is a base R package, we can use this file path sans extension, ext, which will remove that.html or any other extension for you. And then base name will keep the base name of any file path. So it'll keep just this piece of each of the uh, link paths that I path, pass to it. Uh, but I know that the player code also needs to contain this slash or this, this character slash and then the, the player code. And this slash is actually the first letter of each of the codes, uh, at least when I looked across all of that. So what I do is I just do a substring to grab the first string there 
and paste it onto it. So at the end of the day, what I end up with is a, a field called player code that has the first letter slash and then the, the player's code there. So we execute all that. And there we go. We get the, you know, Andre Wiggins and then W slash W wig I N O one, which is his player code on, on the website there. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, try this out on a single player because we're going to be wanting, wanting to scrape, um, some shooting information out of this. So what we do is I keep, keep just a little Bron James. I want to filter this down so that I can generalize this in the future. Um, so I, I scrape the player information. I then use this, this, uh, this glue function, which is from the glue library. So very well named. And what it does is it allows you to write these strings, but you can actually define your R objects that you want to be using in curly braces within it. So it's actually a really cool way to just inline write out. I want to have player info dollar sign player code. So player info dollar sign player code is LeBron James's player code information that we're going to be want, wanting to be using. So we test that out and pull that. Um, and then we pull down the URL there. So, um, so this is the website that we're going to be pulling from um, the information out of. And then Patrick, you kind of went through and you created the, the next piece of the scraping. So why don't you take us through that? Yeah, so I want the data that underpins that shot chart that Here, I'll bring that up saw. again. And uh, you can hover over the points. You'll see that there is data indeed underneath it. So uh, there's, a, there's a long comment for each one that gives you some information about the game, what quarter it was in, how much time was running, um, the, the distance of the shot, uh, et, et cetera, the score, all those kinds of things. So we want that. That's the information that we want because ultimately – that information is going to then contain the X and Y coordinates where each of those shots were taken. So I create this um, uh, this object called table info, and basically I take that player shooting HTML that we just created, and I look for the nodes. Uh, the same concept that uh, Ellis just showed about um, inspecting the table page. I looked at the table page and I found that the shot chart info was in this node called ID equals shot chart. Um, and it's in there as a comment. So on any of these reference, football reference, basketball reference, college reference pages, um, a lot of the data is stored underneath as a comment where you can um, uh, look at it as like a, almost like a CSV underneath. Um, this data Lots is commented. There we go. On, yeah, this data is commented underneath, in this case, underneath that JPEG of the shot. So I'm pulling out in my code the... Um, the comment, the nodes underneath that comment, and then I'm basically taking that information, turning it into a text, and then turning it into a table. Or fi finding the table of the text. Yep. So we end, right. up, end up with a nice HTML node that contains all that information for us. And there we go. Huzzah. All right. Then, um, so then we apply a similar technique uh, that we did before when we were scraping out all the player names, but this time we know within this tables info, we know all the shot information are actually a class of tooltip. So what we do is we, we pull out all the tooltips here, um, and then for each one of those, we look at the contents and go, all right, what is the information that we actually want to be extracting from this? So we want to be extracting the style, which tells us the location where the shot was, was, was taken. We want to pull out the tip, uh, which is a funny, funny descriptor, but that's actually when you hovered over, uh, hovered over these points there, that what, what showed up um, in the tooltip there, that's defined by the tip attribute. So we want to be scraping that out. And then we also want to be pulling out the result because they also have a class based on whether they were made or missed, which I think then describes the whether it was a, a red X or a green dot on the, on the web page there. So this is extracting whether the shot was made or, or missing. So extract the class uh, attribute. Um, it's a character string that can um, that concatenated all the different classes together. So I do a string split on white or on white spaces there, 
and then I removed the class tooltip from it. So now we have where was the shot made, what is the descriptor of the shot, and was it uh, made or missed for each of the different points there. Uh, so next we had to extract, so let's take a quick look at shots. There's a lot of information here. Let's just do a head. All right, so styling, which is defining where the shot was made, is defined based off of um, the styling that you use for CSS, which is a little bit funky. But basically what you describe here is top. So how far down from the top does this point exist? And then how far from the left side does this point exist? So if you look at this, this point is defined as how far from this line here does it go down? And then how far from this location here does it go over? Right? Mm -hmm. So we, we scraped, we wanted to get all that information out. So we do some regular expressions here to be pulling out. All right, top, I want to keep these digits. Left, I want to keep these digits. And then generate this finally as a tibble that has columns for X and Y, which is the X and Y locations of those shots. So yeah, lots of information here. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, but now, we, now we've got a bunch of information. We've got, and this is all for just LeBron James at this point. Yep. Whether he made or lost or missed a, missed a shot, the description of the shot, and then where that shot was taken, next Y location. So now we can start doing some spatial stuff with it. Yeah. So uh, I give a few options here of, of plotting these things. Uh, the first one, this is just um, plotting the points of makes and misses. So uh, I take that shots details tibble that we just created. Um, I'm going to plot the X and the Y uh, points respectively, and I'm going to color by result, make or miss. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the annotation custom here, we take that court that we added, uh, we uh, extracted from the URL uh, earlier, uh, in our in our setup uh, in our setup chunk, we take that court, we set an x min and a uh, x max, a y min and a y max for it. Uh, basically, this is how far we want that JPEG to sort of stretch within our GG plot. Um, we plot the points. I give them a size four and I give them a alpha to make them a little bit more uh, opaque. So for any plots or any points that are overlying each other, I set my colors to green and orange for makes and misses. Um, I set my X and Y limits of my own plot right there. And then a little bit, we probably don't need the theme minimal since we set that as our main theme to start. And then uh, underneath the uh, plot, we're just going to remove all of the ticks and the titles on the X and Y axis and the lines because they don't really help us with this kind of plot. So we'll go ahead and run that and we get a cool looking uh, half court basketball of LeBron James makes and misses uh, this season. So far, uh, obviously, they're hoping to play some more games, but he's about a 50% shooter, like 49%, which is like absolutely absurd. So, um, yeah, you see what it looks like to be a 50% shooter there. Um, Lots of makes. 50% of them. Yeah, about 50% of them. Um, so that's obviously option one. Uh, option two was that instead of using points, we could do this with uh, hex bins. So... Um, Conceptually, it's the same thing. I load this hex bin uh, uh, package, which is going to give me a function down there called stat bin hex, which basically um, all I did was I replaced geom point with stat bin hex, and everything else is exactly the same. Copy and paste it down, and now we get uh, hex bins instead. So this is then uh, aggregating different shots into these bins, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it makes it a little bit easier. So there's less, less lots of there's less points being plotted so the map will then generate a lot faster yeah too because it's not it's not drawing like 30 points in this one location here where we won't actually see it it's binning it into this one hex correct uh, option three uh, is a heat map this is usually how this stuff was kind of consumed originally from from grantland and kirk goldsbury i load the uh, beardus package there for the, uh, the coloring that I want, the fill that I want. I take that shots detail. Um, I do a little bit of uh, pre-processing here. 
I create a variable called xy, which is basically the xy coordinate uh, concatenated together using the paste function. And then I group by those coordinates to um, create basically a count up of the number of attempts for each coordinate, how many were made, and then the percentage, uh, the field goal percentage from that spot. And now I go ahead and I plot that. So um, to, to plot this, uh, this sort of heat map, I need a Z. So I have an X is my X and a Y. And then my Z is the number of attempts. So this first one is just purely attempts. It's not makes or misses. Uh, just to kind of get a feel for how it works. We run that. And so obviously we have lots of uh, shots from around the court. We have the highest concentration of shots right underneath the rim. Obviously LeBron likes to drive to the basket, try and pick up the foul. He gets a lot of dunks on breakaways because he plays a lot of defense and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So um, nothing surprising there. Looks the next like, step I, is, thought, I think it's interesting too. It looks like yeah. there's there's a lot, he goes at it a lot from the, the left side there, or I guess the right side if you're looking at the basket. So yeah. there's not as many from the left side here. It's more from the right. So that, uh, that was wonder, interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, I, I wonder if it's I, our plot too, or our. Uh, maybe it's easier as as a right-handed shooter to like. Maybe. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't just know. just an interesting pattern that I just noticed right now. So. Yeah, we need we need a basketball expert to. Yeah, help, help us out. Tease Give out us, a lot. Put a right. comment in the in the in the yeah. video here to yeah, tell us curious. what what yeah. we're doing. Um, the next one is uh, we we spelled successful wrong, but uh, the percent of successful shots. So uh, again, we did a little bit of uh, uh, pre-processing there. Same thing, made to misses. This time I changed the Z to percent. So this is percent is just a reflection of his field goal percent. I guess I could have been more explicit there. Um, but everything else uh, stayed the same. The only thing now is we're changing the coloring of percent instead of attempts. And now we see our nice little heat map. Um, we could have done some other work, obviously, to if we colored in the JPEG, we could have colored in the JPEG and then these, you know, uh, maybe like an, uh, a light orange, like a basketball court. And then these points would have maybe uh, stood out a, a tad bit more. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, pretty cool. I think this shows this shows a good pattern, though. Like, yeah, make, making making a lot from from these areas over up in here. Yeah, making a lot around the basket. There's there's less less making here, like further out. Right. The free throw area kind of looks like he's not making a lot there, but I don't know if this includes free throw shots or not. But, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if it yeah, does. We, but I don't think it does. I would mm -hmm. think that there'd be much more spots right at the middle of that free throw line if it did. No, mm -hmm. maybe not. I mean, it's it's an, also entirely possible that these these grid lines aren't showing up exactly the way they they're supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, since we pulled in this moved, image. Exactly, might have moved. Them. The other thing is, I think though, if if it did show free throws there'd be a lot more of the tan right by the line because lebron is like a has an absurdly high free throw percentage i believe so yeah. he you'd see a lot of makes there right, right? well there's this spot this block right here oh uh, so, yeah, so that, maybe that yeah maybe it's just like off by a little bit and that's what's yeah, going on could be uh, yeah it could be that's right yeah yeah well cool but speaking yeah. of the distance of the shots, um, I decided to then also do a little bit of work into looking at shot distances. So I take our shot details table and I do a little bit of um, uh, regularized expression work here. So you can see, although it's it's tough here because the table is cutting off the full description. Um, here, I'll pull out one. Yeah. There we go. So you can see there the distance. So um, what you'll notice in every single row of that column is it follows this same type of um, uh, same type of pattern where the distance is always right there and it's always a number followed by a space followed by FT for feet. So my first kind of uh, move here in creating this distance um, variable within the shot details tibble was to extract the description or take the column description and extract string extract everything that had spaces right before uh, or numbers right a character right before a blank space followed by the s uh, the ft so the slash slash s is the white space the ft is there and i take two dots because I want two characters because obviously 
you can have um, everything from single to double digits. So sometimes it's 25 feet, sometimes it's one foot. The next move that I made was to then extract out only the numbers from the new newly created distance uh, column. So I give it zero to nine, take any of the numbers only, I trim out the white space, so I get rid of that nasty white space that follows the numbers or precedes it if it's a single digit number, and then I convert it to numeric for plotting purposes on a histogram. Okay, cool. so, so now we have shot details. Now we have distance of every shot, so you can see it right there. The X, Y location and distance. That gives us a lot of uh, uh, flexibility to do other things with, obviously. I go ahead and I plot this for LeBron, so we do a GG plot histogram. Um, and we put a little dash mark there that's representative of the three point, the 22 foot three pointer, uh, three point line in the NBA. And so similar to what we saw in the heat map, you can see LeBron takes a lot of high percentage shots right underneath the rim. And then he takes a lot of high point possibility shots um, far behind the three point line. Which totally makes a lot of sense because there's no like value between right here there's no value add between these shots and these shots for for basketball right these are all going to be two points from from zero up to 22 there's no value change and then here i'm guessing it's more of like a, just a comfort comfort in the distance or, like, or it's how the defense plays and like they don't yeah. want to let him get too close they, they but, wanna... uh, basically this shows the death of the long range two if you're going to take a long range <laughs> if you're going to take a long range two just step back a foot and may as well try for three <laughs> yeah the, the value add if you know you're only making 50 percent right here versus here i mean it's it's another couple points right? exactly so you know, there's statistically there's I mean, got to play the game smart right exactly yeah so that's a little bit of nba shot charting mm-hmm and I think we're gonna we're gonna call it there. We're uh, we're at forty minutes now. We don't want to be going too far, but we did have a little piece later on. We'll probably get it get to it in the future about parallel computing and how we could, if we wanted to, be scraping out like all the players using parallel compute. That way, you can try to reduce the time that it takes to run all this. But I think we'll cover that in a future yeah, episode. We could probably do a lot with this once if we scrape out all the players in in that fashion. Uh, that gives us a, a really cool data set to play with in terms of shot locations and shot distances where we could build some um, other types of models that maybe explain how certain players um, perform relative to others and things like that. Yeah, so that might be a fun thing we'll look at in the future. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I think we'll, we'll end it here. Um, so thank you all for listening and sticking with us. Um, I know that I've enjoyed doing this screencast and I've have been getting lots of uh, emails thanking, thanking us for doing this. And I want to say thank you for listening to this. Um, uh, once again, you can. Uh, my name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can contact the both of us at tidy.explained at gmail.com. And we appreciate you listening. Yeah, keep on exploring your world. <laughs>